What's happening everybody? It's Matt Faircloth. Welcome. Welcome to today's live webinar. I'm going to be talking to you guys about some cool stuff about multifamily. Today I want to talk about multifamily. Uh, I've got a, a few multifamily deals in the pipeline and I'm excited about multifamily. So why not? Multifamily is a hot topic. Let's get in and talk. So do me a favor before we even get going. Do me a favor and just everybody give her a thumbs up. Like this video because it tells Facebook, tells YouTube that you guys like these things and it tells Facebook, hey, Facebook and YouTube, I want you guys to show more of this to other people because I like this. So give it a thumbs up. And I, and I can see the thumbs up come across my screen. That makes me excited. Makes you guys excited too because you see other people like it and you guys like it or other else likes it too, right? So do me a favor and let's like this. This is a Q&A session. I'm going to teach you a few topics about multifamily and then we're going to do Q&A. And I, wanted, I want you guys to generate the cues, the questions, and I'm going to give you guys some answers, my thoughts on the multifamily space and any type of multifamily conversation and really anything at all you guys want to get yourselves into. We can go ahead and talk about that. Just let me know what you guys want to talk about uh, on Q&A. Just start typing the questions on the um, Facebook or YouTube feed, whatever you guys are watching on. Just type in questions and I'll hop in and answer those questions as best I can and we can have a cool conversation. Sound good? Um, before we get into that, I want to just, I'm going to get, just teach a few things about market selection. I want you guys to select a multi a market for multifamily. Um, it is not my opinion that you should be shopping anywhere for multifamily. And this is, um, and this goes without saying if, to some people, but some of you guys might think that, you know, a deal is a deal and I'll just go and jump into the market and wherever the deal is, that's where I'm going to buy. I firmly believe that you guys need to do market research and do some market networking before you go in and buy multifamily in a market. Um, and this is assuming a lot of other things that you guys have already done with regards to building your network and building your track record and uh, working your way up into buying and into getting involved in bigger multifamily real estate. Assuming you've done all of that, now it's time to select a market. Um, I'm going to be teaching a webinar tonight for tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern for Bigger Pockets. We're going to talk about all the other stuff. We're also going to talk about market selection. On this uh, this live session, I just want to talk about things you guys got to do in a market once you pick it up. So the first and for the the biggest thing you've got to do when you choose a market for multifamily or really for any type of real estate, you guys got to find a property manager. Unless you're going to self-manage, and if you're going to self-manage, the property ought to be in your own backyard, like very close to where you live. I don't recommend self-managing if you don't live near the property. Um, but if you're going to uh, buy out of the area, you got to find a really great property manager. Not, not a good property manager, but a great property manager um, that can uh, run that property for you and execute your business plan and bring about the profitability you want to see for that piece of real estate. So um, I recommend that, that before you start making offers on properties, you start interviewing property managers that are in the markets you guys want to be in. Um, and I only recommend you pick like one to two market sectors that are markets that you like across the U.S. Drill into those markets, find property managers that you like, um, and, uh, and then maybe they can even help you generate some leads. Um, property management companies that I like to work with uh, should have in-house maintenance. And if the property is large enough, they should have the capacity to handle on-site staff, including meaning like payroll, um, leasing agents, uh, maintenance staff, everybody, the on-site full, the full burden staff that works for the management company whose just sole purpose is to run your is to run your piece of real estate. That's what you get when you buy large pieces of real estate, typically above 80 units. Um, smaller than that, you're going to have a management company where the property manager and the uh, maintenance technician are probably working for other properties as well. They, they're working for yours too. Um, but uh, you want to find a manager that has in-house maintenance that works for their company. They, they, I don't like management companies that sub out their manage, their maintenance um, because it, it lo they lose some control over that and you're going to have to pay a markup on maintenance. Um, as well. So that is one of the facets that I like to have when I choose a market is a really great property manager. I'm going to take a second and see if we've got any Q&A coming in here. Um, you go, oh man, I got a ton going on. Facebook is just doing it up. Here we go. Let me jump in and answer some Facebook questions. Here we go. Uh, hi, Jared. Jared, here's your high five. Bow. High five to you. In duplex to fourplex, do you pay for the heat and electric or is the tenant responsible for everything? Good question. And hey, hey, Andrea. Andrea says, hey, hey. I say, hey, hey to you. Okay, so Jared, it, um, 
depends on the structure of the property. I mean, I don't offer to pay for the heat and utilities for tenants if it's already structured for them paying for heat and utilities. Um, I try to uh, get it out of our name if I can. It's maybe hard to do up front. Uh, it's something you might have to do some construction or some redevelopment of or separating the utilities by putting in new machines and pulling things out of your name and all that. So it might take some untangling, but for small properties like that, like duplexes um, and quads, I try and get the utilities out of my name as best I can. Um, might not happen that way initially. You might have to save up to do that, but it, so it might be something you have to do down the road. But um, but it is something that you can do um, if you budget for it and if you notify your tenants. If you're gonna pay the utilities, you wanna make sure you're getting property co properly compensated by your tenants, meaning charging rent fees um, that cover that utility reimbursement for yourself. Um, so it's okay to do it either way, Jared, but, um, but I recommend doing it um, I recommend doing it where, where the tenants are or have the utilities in their name. A question from Tim. What do you look for what, what, what do you look for when researching a good multifamily market? That's a great question, Tim. Um, hang on, my friend. Hang on. And I get into a lot again, webinar tonight. I'll even type it in here for you guys. Um, teaching a webinar tonight for BP. Um, I go to biggerpockets.com forward slash webinars and on that webinar I go and do a deep dive about what I like at what I look for out of markets. Um, but uh, but that's okay. We can I can answer that briefly now as well. Um, but uh, but I'll get back to that because it's part of what I'm going to talk about is what I was what I look for in market selection. So great question. I'll get to you on that one. Let me check my friends over on. Uh, man, YouTube's blowing up too. Here we go. Um, I'm just going to write that down, Tim. Just to make sure I get to it. Um, all right, here we go on uh, YouTube, blowing up here. How to refinance my uh, how to refinance my house as a multifamily home and live in it. I mean, you got to talk to mortgage broker on that one. Um, Alpha, uh, do you have a property recommendation for setting up our first uh, PPM? Do you have a company recommendation for setting up our first PPM? I don't recommend companies. I would probably do a search on Bigger Pockets Alpha for some recommendations there. You probably need a good law firm that can do it. The only recommendation I would give you, Alpha, is that use a law firm that pri their primary function is doing PPMs for legal uh, for apartment building syndications. Don't use a, a general a general practitioner law firm. Use a company that's their mainstay is what they do. Um, uh, do you experience with Evolve? Pro no, never heard of that property management company, Stephen. I'm not sure where they are. Um, Julian, do you have a mentor that you shout out before you got into multifamily? Yeah, I, met, I mentored with Joe Fairless. I'm not afraid to say that because he's good people. Um, and I mentored with Joe Fairless. He taught me a lot of the multifamily space. I was a smaller residential landlord for years. And I was a small residential landlord and a flipper before I got into multifamily about five years ago. And uh, Joe Farrell has taught me a lot. I want to know about it. So I'm glad to throw, give him a, a, a due, due respect there. Um, Julian, do you have a mentor? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, E.G., how can, we get start, how can we start with multifamily units? I don't know if I would start with it, E.G., um, on tonight's webinar, I talk about how you can be a part of a team that's buying multifamily because I talk about the, there's four seats on the multifamily bus um, being like the bus that takes you to buying a multifamily. There's four active parties that are on a part of that conversation. Um, on tonight's webinar, I talk about that in detail. So go to biggerpockets.com forward slash uh, webinars and see if I can type it in here. Bigger pockets. There you go. Okay. Go to biggerpockets.com forward slash webinars. That's a comment that came from my YouTube page, my DeRosa group page, but that's okay. She'll be able to answer it. Um, Joe is a beast. You're funny, Julian. Um, yeah. So go to, go to that link and then you can set it. You can sign up for the webinar, EG, and that'll, that should teach you what you want to know. Um, and it's a free webinar. Free. Um, young. So I'm different from a different country. The loan interest rate here is about, wow, 9.5% young. Wow. Um, we take things for granted here in this country. The problem is here that the rent and the monthly installment never equates. What should I do then? I would try and invest in another country where the, where the interest rates and you know, where the rents do uh, work out for you. Um, uh, Oliver, are the OOS properties a good way to start for beginning? I'm not sure. Uh, Oliver, type in what OOS means. I'm not sure. Um, 
Mohammed, is there a spreadsheet to help run the numbers for before buying apartments? I use the Bigger Pockets calculators. So we're going to go over that. We're going to do a deal using the Bigger Pockets calculators tonight, Mohammed. So uh, if you go to tonight's webinar, uh, tonight's free webinar, you can uh, check that out. I'll get into that. Um, Daniel, should you use a 30-year loan for multifamily and refinance that loan after a year? I would only, I would go interest only if you're going to refinance in a year. I would just do an interest only loan. Um, Daniel, I'd do like a short-term bridge loan. Orlando. How to find a good contractor. That's, that's a loaded question, my friend. Um, but there are good ones out there. They say you should go to Home Depot at like 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning and see who's there buying materials because it's likely going to be contractors. And just go and network at Home Depot or at Lowe's like early, early in the morning right when they open up because good contractors are there first thing in the morning. Uh, so then, then go and network at those, at those types of stores first thing. Um, Julian... Um, how do you have a contractor walk the property management company to determine the renovation plan for the property? Um, I, so most of the property managers I deal with also have in-house construction. So yes, I have the property manager and the construction arm walk uh, the property before we, even before we buy it. Before we buy the property, I have the PM do a full walkthrough for us. They're willing to do that. A lot of the big PMs are. Um, how fast is too fast for scaling up? Good, great question. Um, and uh, it's it's uh, it's hard to say. Um, I mean, I just lost this. Ugh, I lost my place here. That's okay. Um, there you go. There's Justin. Uh, how fast do you fast for scaling up? Great question, Justin. I think that. Um, I recommend that you try and double your portfolio every time you do a deal when you're first getting started. So I do not recommend you buy one deal and then you go buy yourself, try and buy a 100 unit apartment building. I'm not one of those, because I'm not selling a seminar or selling a boot camp. I'm not gonna tell you that you can go ahead and do that right out of the gate. Maybe folks that are trying to sell you something will tell you that, um, but that's not me. So I recommend that you double your portfolio every time you do a deal in the beginning. So do one, then do two, then do four, then do eight, then do 16, then do 32, then do 64. And when you hit a good level, then um, then you'll you'll find that you can start doing the same size deal over and over again. But I don't recommend that you scale, um, you know, that you step up that fast. You know, that you step from step one and then do the step go jump up to step ten. Um, yours, the the uh, the velocity of your scale, Justin, has a lot to do with the the size of your team. Like how quick can you handle the growth? Um, Jermaine, do you mean buying a multifamily property as your first investment? You can, Jermaine, if it's small, if it's your very first investment, I recommend that you live in the property, that it's a house hack, meaning you buy a duplex and you move into one unit and rent out the other one. I think that should be everybody's first rental property. It was mine. Um, that's what I, that's what I think your first investment should be. Um, uh, Alex, what are some key factors on how to tell if the market is oversaturated? I just price. If the price has stopped making sense and if the price has gone way, way up and the brokers are telling you they're getting multiple bids and the properties are get, are bidding over asking, to me, that's an oversaturated market. Um, some would disagree with me. Some would think that's just a hot market that you should try and get into, but I think that's oversaturated personally. Um, Habib, what is the best way to finance investment property? I, I've run out of VA and FHA and enti entitlements for now. Um, you're probably going to have to... Um, look towards more of an LLC based loan with a small community bank and put together the 20% to buy the property, the 20% down. That's what I think you're going to have to do, Habib. Um, I'm completely new to this. What is, what is considered a multifamily, Simon? Um, Simon, it's, it's a loaded question. So some would say like a multifamily is anything. I think it's really anything about four units because a small multi or a property you could live in could be two, three, four, two, three or four units. Anything above four has to be a commercial loan. So I would call multifamily like five and up. On tonight's webinar that I'm going to teach for Bigger Pockets, that you can get to by going to Bigger Pockets forward slash webinars, um, I'm going to uh, teach about larger multi, like 50, 60, 70 units. That's what I'm going to get into, Simon. So if that's of interest to you, you should go to biggerpockets.com forward slash webinars. That is a free webinar I'm going to teach. Um, Okay, I'm going to jump over to Facebook real quick, answer any more Facebook questions. And then I, I've got other stuff I want to teach, by the way. Um, uh, other uh, other uh, stuff that I want to get into with you guys. So um, you guys are all, you guys are freaking slinging out some great questions. So I want to answer those too. So I guess we, I might want to just keep going with those. Um, da, 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 da. Andres, um, I'm in the refinance part of a burr deal, but I can't 
but I can because I went self-employed three months ago with no banks like that. Any suggestions? Well, I would talk to enough banks. You might have to do an asset-based loan at a higher interest rate, Andres. Um, there are other there are asset-based lenders out there. Look on Bigger Pockets or search in the Bigger Pockets forums to see if you can find some recommendations. Um, okay, Jeff, Seven Doors LLC umbrella or both? Both, my friend. LLC for Seven Doors, absolutely. You need an LLC and you need an umbrella insurance policy for that many doors as well. Um, Michael, how do you suggest managing the property manager? I've heard that you have to stay on top of them because they can be good one moment and horrible the next. That is a fact, Michael. That is an absolute fact. You've got to stay right on top of them. I just, you've got, you can't give them an inch. You've got to do regular calls with them. You've got to um, audit their financial statements and really, really, you know, jump into your PM uh, and, and review their statements with a fine tooth comb. Uh, Joshua, I have a local question. Good. Do you have any lenders that can recommend that refinance without a good seasoning requirement? Any good lenders for low rate, high LTV bridge loan? Um, hmm. I would, I, I hate to keep saying this, but I would look on Bigger Pockets. I don't want to name any specific names, but I mean, Bigger Pockets is a great source because I don't want you people to think that I recommended one company or another company or whatever because um, I'm not affiliated with any company. Um, there are a ton of recommendations for that kind of stuff on the Bigger Pockets forums. And there's also a Bigger Pockets hard money lender database, uh, Joshua. So I would definitely look there on the Bigger Pockets forums. You just do a post in the Bigger Pockets forums in the local geography and see if you can find somebody there. Um, Amy, what are your thoughts on new construction multifamily? Can structure can structure it without minimal money down, but can create 300 units over low cash flow, but, but a great asset? Um, I'd be careful, Amy, on what rents you're gonna be charging, because you said it's lower cash flow. So I would be careful. If your rents need to be at the absolute tippy top for, to generate that lower cash flow, I would be careful, because I think their rents have gone way up the last couple of years. So if rents, if we have a bit of a recession, Rents are probably going to be the first things to dip, and so if your property rents have to drop, you know, 50 bucks or 100 bucks, uh, is that going to put your property underwater? If it is, I probably wouldn't do the deal. So I would be careful on new construction. If and I've, I've found that most developers have to charge a super premium rents to make their new construction make sense. So I might not, I might not do it just for that. Um, because rents have gone way up, and so I don't, I wouldn't want to be involved in anything that's at the top of the spectrum right now. Um, okay, cool. Uh, I'm going to jump in and teach a few more things here. So this is today, just, I wanted to talk to you guys about picking markets. You guys have asked a ton of great questions, but my conversation, which we can talk about whatever y'all want. Um, but the conversation I'm having is about picking markets. So here are a few things you need to have in place once you've picked a market. Now, um, my man, uh, Tim asked a few questions about picking a market. So let me, let me answer that one first. Market selection. I like to have markets that have a population of above 300 people or 300,000 because anything smaller than that, you're not, you're not going to have a large enough demographic to really move the multifamily. Like you, you don't, you've, you've kind of got a small town and the multifamily world doesn't perform very well or has the propensity to, you know, fall off a lot if that small town dies or if uh, population drops quickly or something like that. So I like large populations, not, doesn't it be a $10 million, a 10 million population city or one, or like a top five MSA in the U.S. It's just to be above three, 300,000. And there are and a lot of cities in the U.S. are above 300,000. Most major cities are above 300,000. Um, this is a good, good indicator, uh, Tim. If the city you're in has any type of major or minor league team, so if they don't have any team at all, like no minor league baseball, no minor league hockey, no minor league anything, I probably wouldn't do business there. And that sounds so stupid, but you know what? Major League Baseball and National and the National Hockey League and those organizations have done their homework and what cities are growing, what cities are would, would follow a team if there's a large enough demographic to follow a team. So honestly, one of my indicating factors is if there is some sort of a sports team in that town, I will invest there. Um, and it's not, that's not the only reason. There's a ton of other factors, but that is a population indicator um, because you're not going to see a sports team in a town with 30,000 people. That's not enough to support a sports team. So it, it, once you get above 100, 200, 300 in there is where you start to see it. And then you get above a million, you'll, start, you'll see a major league team um, in that. So if you're in that world, think that way. Um, with regards to employment, I like to see diverse employment, uh, meaning like not one industry employs the, employs most of the town. So not just oil and gas, not just medical, not just auto manufacturing. I can't have 
that one plant closed or that industry experience a slowdown and that'll cause uh, a lot of exodus from the town and cause my rents to drop and cause my occupancy to drop um, and that. So I, I tend to not invest where there is only one industry or two industries. I like economic diversity in medium to large cities um, and, uh, and, and areas, and I don't, this sounds silly, but areas that aren't getting a ton of national attention from other real estate investors. So I invest in markets you don't hear a lot of other investors talking about. Um, in that, so that's but that's me. That's uh, maybe you call me weird about that, but those are where I go. You guys develop your own parameters on where you guys want to invest, and then once you get that, as I said, make sure you have a good property manager. Make sure you've got what I call boots on the ground. Now, if you don't live local to the community, you need to go on bigger pockets and find yourself someone who is either a newer investor or someone who's willing to just partner with you for an exchange for being the legs for the deal. That's willing to go to the property do inspections for you, um, be a lot of the eyes and ears uh, for you on the property and inspect inspect work done by the contractors and everything like that. Um, so you've got to find someone who's willing to be your boots for you um, on a day-to-day -day basis on those properties, okay? Um, so that, and that's, that's they're easy-ish to find, but you got to pick the right person who's willing to, who's willing to know the nuts and bolts. Um, let me do one more, one more item and then we'll jump into more Q&A, okay? Um, when once you select your market, you want to kind of pick, put together a map of the city, and I strongly suggest you put yourself on an airplane and go to the city and investigate it, and meet with people, and network and everything like that. But beyond that, drive around the city and get to know the econo the, the economic ends of the spectrum. Where are the A level neighborhoods? Where are the B, C, and D level neighborhoods? On tonight's webinar, uh, we're going to talk a lot about that. The free webinar I'm teaching at Bigger Pockets by you can register for by going to biggerpockets.com forward slash webinars. It is a free webinar I'm teaching tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern. That is 8 p.m. Eastern tonight that you guys need to be on. If you can't make it, go to webinar, go to that webinar link and register anyway because you'll get an email with the uh, with the the recording that you can watch later. Okay, so. Those are the uh, those are some factors. I got a few more we can go over if we have enough time. I wanted to answer a few more questions for you guys. I want to make sure you guys got that webinar link. So let me let me just comment real quick. I'm going to put in the comment bar right now um, the the link for that webinar. Okay, there we go. Okay, okay. All right, good stuff. There it is. Uh, now, questions, questions, questions. Let me go to YouTube first. I'll answer a few YouTube questions. Um, man, you guys are blowing me up. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, cool. You are welcome. <laughs> uh, Julian, we got we got a partial settlement. We haven't we haven't gotten the whole thing back, but we got a partial settlement so far on the, from that you know knucklehead with the 1031 exchange. You must have read about that in my book. I hope that's what happened. Um, Julian, but thanks for asking. Uh, we're getting there. Um, you know, hopefully we'll get the rest of it back this year, but uh, we got a partial settlement. So thank you for asking, Julian. Um, uh, cool. Tony's going to be on the uh, webinar tonight. Awesome, Tony from Waxhaw, North Carolina. North Carolina. Um, just, uh, JK, California's government's probably going to enact a rent control statewide later this year. Does rent control always have a negative impact on multifamily property values? I don't think so, JK, because it depends on what kind of deals you're looking to do. Rent control can affect A-class real estate. If you're doing, well, it'll affect, it'll affect a, a lot of real estate as I think more about it, JK. Um, if you're looking to do big value add stuff, you want to read the rent control laws on what it is you're able to do to increase rents on a tenant. Like for us, if we're going to increase rents on a tenant more than appreciate, more than like um, just cost of living increases, like you know one to two percent. If we're going to do anything more than a one or two, one to two percent rent increase, um, we will um, typically do some improvement to the tenant for the tenant. Like if I'm renting a unit for seven hundred bucks. I'll typically say, okay, if I'm gonna, I'll charge the tenant an additional seventy-five dollars per month in rent. But I'm gonna go and make some improvements to their unit. I'm gonna go give them ceiling fans, new appliances, um, maybe upgrade their kitchen, do other improvements I can do to give them that value that they're willing to pay for. I, it is my opinion. I'm not a lawyer. It is my opinion that adding that type of value to a tenant's unit and delivering them something that's beyond what they had before 
is outside of the rent control laws that it's not they're not renting the same unit anymore they're renting an improved unit and they can choose to move out and if and in some states you might have to give them the choice to not elect to receive those improvements um and that but uh, but i believe in most states if you make significant improvements capital improvements to the property not maintenance level improvements but capital improvements to the property that you can charge more rents even under rent control law that is my opinion i'm not a lawyer um and that but uh, but you can uh, you can check that out further um you're welcome habib uh, a few more questions. Sorry if I skip over a few. Um, how does one negotiate mortgages with a banker? Uh, with a um, with a shotgun, uh, young uh, young Buddha asked. How you negotiate mortgages with the bank? I think when you, I think it's armed, you have to do it. I'm just kidding. Um, it's hard to negotiate mortgages with banks because they kind of know they got you. They know that you need the money. Um, I've been able to get them to to adjust a little bit, um, but uh, but not not major shifts in there in what they're willing to do. Um, banks that I dealt with typically dig their heels in. Um, uh, it's cool. The money pro method, it's absolutely possible to make a ton of money in multifamily homes. Just got to understand the locations and opportunities, plan conservatively. Love it. Um, uh, did you know your website has white text above a white background? You'll have to help me with that. I'm not, I'm not a webby guy, Trent. I'm, I'm just a real estate dude. Uh, not not the best with the web stuff, but thank you for letting me know. Uh, and it could be on bigger pockets, maybe not mine. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> cool. Uh, let me jump over to to uh, to um, BP and not to BP to Facebook and see if I can grab a few more questions here, and then I'll teach a few more points. Um, what are some of those cities? Oh, sure. I mean, we're in we're involved in Lexington, Kentucky. We're looking in Louisville. Um, we're shopping in Charleston, South Carolina. We don't have anything there, but we're shopping there. We're in several cities in North Carolina. Um, we're looking in like the Hampton Roads part of Virginia. Uh, those are those are all meet our criteria. Uh, we're looking in Baltimore, uh, Pittsburgh. Those are a few cities. I don't know if you know this one, but Lancaster, Pennsylvania. If you're if you're from there, you say Lancaster, but uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, if you're from anywhere else in the world, that's how you pronounce it. Um, that would be, those are a few that were, that were in right there. I hope that helps, Amy. Um, let me see. I don't want to read more of you guys' questions again. Not, te not techie guy. Here we go. All right. Let me read all the comments. Uh, Amy, can cities that are not popular with big investors, cities that are not popular with big investors, but are still great options. I think you're right. I'm going to like your comment, Amy. I like that. Um, cool. All right. A few more, um, a few more tips. You know, I'll do, I'll do a few more questions on, on, uh, YouTube first and then I'll do a few, I'll do a few more questions and I got three more tips on selecting markets. Then I got to go cause I got to get ready for this webinar tonight that you guys can go to by going to biggerpockets.com forward slash webinars. Um, Dre, how to refi 50 units? Should I use a credit partner? If you don't have the credit yourself, Dre, then yeah, you can use a credit partner, but you're gonna, you might have to give us some equity in the deal. Um, would you invest in college towns of 50K population with a state school? No, I would not. Um, because to do that, I so I do not invest in student rentals. That does not mean you cannot make money with student rentals. That just means I do not do it. I believe that investing in a college town where it's it's that small of a town, like 50,000 um, 50, population uh, with a state school, you would likely have to rent to uh, students. The state school is a solid employer, never going anywhere. Um, where we invest in Lexington, Kentucky has U UK, University of Kentucky, uh, is there and they employ like 14,000 people. So universities provide a lot of jobs. Those are good things. Jobs are good because they enable people to make the money so that they can live nicely, comfortably in your apartment building and pay the rent. I would not invest. The problem I'm having with your question is a 50,000 population town because I believe that a lot of that population in the town is going to be considered to be students. So if you're saying 50,000 population, the university is outside of that and it's a large university like, you know, 15, 20,000, like I went to Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech's population, Blacksburg, Virginia's population was probably 30 to 40,000 people. But Virginia Tech as a college beyond that had a 25,000 student population. The reason why I wouldn't invest in a town like that is because I would end up having to, just 
by necessity, by the by the economy of the town, having to take student renters. I do not rent to students uh, by my model. There are many, many other student renter landlords, and there are student rental um, concepts and strategies out there. But there is it's a whole nother business. It cannot be treated like regular multifamily landlording. You know, because students want to move in 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 August, and if you have vacancies, um, if you have a vacancy in September in a student rental property, you're likely going to have that vacancy throughout the entire year, Um, and that because it'll be hard to fill it with another student because they're already where they want to be. Um, So not just that reason. There is a number of reasons why I don't rent to students, and it's not because I think I'm better. It's just because I have. That's not a strategy we have developed as a company. So um, that's why on student rentals. Um, So no, short answer to your question. Uh, my father has a rental single family home, um, Daniel, and his residence. He said he's willing to tap into those homes. What is the best for that? A HELOC, credit line, cash? So I wouldn't do a cash out refinance, Daniel, because a cash out refinance means he's going to pull the money out and then have to use it right away. Um, or he's going to have to start paying debt on that on that money. I would just do a HELOC because then the money's there. He can use it when he wants. The line of credit is there to use it when he wants it, but not when he doesn't. So that's why what I would do is a HELOC. Um... I don't see the link. I'm going to type it in again, Daniel. Um, guys, go, just take a minute right now. Go to Bigger Pockets. Bigger Pockets. You'll see Brandon's webinar tomorrow and mine's to, the mine is tonight. Forward slash webinars. Okay. Biggerpockets.com forward slash webinars. Um, okay. And that, I don't know why it's not Let me do that. Uh, well, I'll try one more time. Okay, I don't know, it's not let me brought not let me post it. Oh, oh there it is. Okay. Um, cool, there it is. Uh, all the scroll away to the the bottom, uh, Dana. Anyway, uh, tonight's webinar is free, 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 eight PM Eastern, be there or be square. Brandon's teaching one tomorrow, I'm teaching one tonight. You should go to both of them. Um, but uh, but check out mine uh, most especially. Stefan from Romania. If you guys have been to webinar, my webinars before, I like to give a high five to whoever's the furthest from me. So here is your high five, Stefan from Romania. Um, cool. And thanks for reading the book, Julian. I appreciate you. Um, by the way, Bigger Pockets requires me to ask you to give the book a review on Amazon. Um, please, 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 Julian, give it a review on Amazon. I need you. Um, okay, Young Buddha, thanks for answering. Sure, you're welcome, Young Buddha. Um, Robert, any info on Dallas Fort Worth area? I don't invest there, Robert. I'm going to be there in two days. I'm flying to Dallas on Thursday for Michael Blank's uh, conference. I'm lucky enough to be speaking there. Um, so Kelly, we're in Fayetteville, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Um, oh man, here we go. Since here, what is a 1031? Now you're really going there. That's a good question. Here we go. 1031 exchange. You sell one piece of real estate. Likely you will have to pay tax on uh, capital gains tax on selling that piece of real estate. What if you could sell that piece of real estate and then buy another piece of real estate with the proceeds from selling this and roll all the proceeds into this? You can, and that process is called a 1031 exchange, meaning you can sell this piece of real estate, not have to pay any tax on the sale on the sales revenue or the sales profit, and roll all your profit, every nickel of it, all of it, into a larger piece of real estate. There are a ton of rules, ton of regulations, which I'm not going to get into right now. But in general, since a 1031 is where you can sell one piece of real estate and roll your profit up into a larger piece of real estate tax free. Okay, that is a 1031. Great question, and it is a tool that's used by many many real estate investors when they're trading up and trading up and trading up their real estate. Okay. Um, how can I start real estate when I'm 18? I think you should intern, um, Danny, with a large real estate company or with, um, try and get as much exposure as you can to real estate by working underneath some successful real estate investors, realtors, uh, financiers, people that are involved in the space and glean as much as you can, learn as much as you can by interning for three to four years. And then with a goal to start up on your own when you're 22, that's what I think you should do is just to mentally design and a four year interning program to get a four-year degree in real estate by doing a different real estate thing every year. So eight, when you're 18, do one thing. When you're 19, do something else. 20, do something else. And 21, do something else. And by the time you're 22, you will have had enough exposure to the real estate investing space over the next four years that you can go off on your own and be super educated and have your own little degree that you design for yourself. That's what I think you should do, Danny. Um, or you can go to community college and get a business degree. Get a two-year degree in business. That's all you need. Um, so 
Eddie, I have a 30 year mortgage on my, my questions are refinancing a 15 years better option than start adding money to the principal and keeping it 30. Oh, Eddie, all day long, keep it at 30 years. Do not refinance it at 15. Here's why. If something happens, like if you refinance at 15 years, you are obligated to make that 15 year amortized payment every month. If you keep it at 30, you can just make that accelerated payment when you choose to. But if something happens or if you end up, you know, getting laid off or whatever uh, for a couple months or you know, whatever may happen, you can not make that extra big payment uh, for a month or two uh, while you get yourself back on your feet. But if you do a 15 year, you're obligated to make it every month. So I think keep it at 30, just make accelerated payments, Danny. Who has that? Eddie. Okay, two more questions. I'm going to teach you guys a few things and I got to go. Um, Viviana is from Virginia Tech as well. Cool. I'm from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So is Dre. Lived in Investor for 15 years. Talk about deals. Cool. Yeah, we have our properties in Elizabethtown, Dre. Um, we have a 49 unit in Elizabethtown. Um, cool. Julian, stop with your crazy talk. You're my 100th review. Thank you. I remember talking to you about that now. You're, that's, yeah. you're, uh, you're in that. Now you're refreshing my memory. Thank you. You're my hundredth review, and I love that about you. If I see you at the Bigger Pocket Bigger Pockets conference, I got a high five and a hug for you. Um, yeah, sorry, Steph. Sorry, Stephen. The questions are coming fast and furious, my man. If I missed your question or anybody else's, I really, I'm sorry. Uh, and it's not, it's, it's, uh, it's not your fault. It's mine for just not reading these these questions fast enough. All right, I got to teach a few more time, a few more points, and then I got to go. Um, cool. Uh, when you're picking a market, okay. Um, what I want you guys to do is you, you've picked your market, you've you found a property manager, you found yourself some boots on the ground, and you've analyzed the A, B, C, and D neighborhoods of the property. It's all data you've got to collect and the team you've got to have in place, okay? I will go into way more detail on tonight's webinar, you, which you can register for by going to biggerpockets.com forward slash webinars, biggerpockets.com forward slash webinars. And you can register for my webinar tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern. Be there, be square. Um, if you can be there, great. If you can't be there, go register for the webinar anyway because you'll get an email with a recording you can watch between now and Wednesday at midnight. Okay. Next thing you got to do is once you've got a market is analyze the rents, do a really good rental analysis. And, and I can tell you any reasonable size market that's above 300,000 people is going to have A class rents, B class rents, C class rents, and D class rents. Okay. Scale those out, write down the full spectrum of rents for a market. Um, in that because not every one bedroom is going to rent for the same in a large city like that. Okay, so scale out your rents, write down what amenities you got to deliver to get the top rent and what amenities you can, you don't have to do to get the middle of the road rent. Okay, find out who the heavy hitties, hitters are. So if you're investing in Dallas, understand my buddy Joe Fairless is a large is a large player in the city of Dallas, um, as are other players. It's a big city, so there's other players there too. Um, so find out who the heavy hitters are in the multifamily world in the city that you're investing in. Read on bigger pockets in the forums if you're looking at Charlotte, North Carolina. Read on the on the forum posts in Charlotte, North Carolina on who's active there and maybe try and take them out for coffee or try and get a, a web call going with them or ask them how you can help them out and help them grow and maybe mentor under, underneath them for a little bit. Okay. So who are the heavy hitters? What do they own? What are they up to? What are their goals? Um, so that's it on market selection. Um, and, uh, and just one more time, biggerpockets.com forward slash webinars. Uh, the link is here in, on Facebook. It's here on YouTube on both spots. I really hope you guys can make it because I want to see you guys there. Okay. Um, I really want to see you guys be successful in multifamily. I want to teach you guys what I've learned about multifamily. We're going to have a great conversation tonight. It'd be like an hour and a half conversation all about multifamily and how you guys can be successful. Even if you're just getting started in the world of multifamily real estate. Okay. Um, Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here, guys. I'm sorry if I didn't get to all your questions, but you guys came at me fast and furious with lots of questions tonight. I loved it, but I couldn't get to all of them, and I'm sorry about that. Um, but I hope you guys can keep the conversations going on with each other, and I hope you guys can now all join my webinar tonight. I'm going to run. Have a great night, guys. Thank you for, thank you for watching.